Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is James Hughes, and I am the Minister Councillor for Economic Affairs at the British Embassy, Warsaw. And it's our great pleasure to, to co-host this event today. Um, but I'd like to start by thanking our partners, the Institute for Sustainable Development, uh, which has organised today's event with our support. Here at the British Embassy Warsaw, we wanted to organise something a little bit different. We wanted to organise something like today's session in order to stimulate debate further here in Poland about what science tells us about climate change. I relate that back to our everyday lives and experiences. There's one thing that the last year has taught us, of course, it is uh, the importance of science uh, and the use of science and analysis in policy making and the development of policy interventions. Now, the topic of today's conversation is a very British way of starting a conversation by talking about the weather. Um, and over for the last few years, the weather has become a hot topic, uh, pun intended, for people from many different countries, not only the UK. And not just because it has been snowing in Poland even this week after the official start of spring, um, but we've all noticed extreme changes in seasons and the increase in frequency and impact and danger of natural disasters such as hurricanes and wildfires and closer to home storms and floods. This November, the UK will be hosting COP26 in Glasgow. And this is a crucial moment in our global effort to combat climate change. Our ambition as the incoming presidency is for COP26 to be the moment when the world comes together to ramp up momentum towards a climate resilient, zero carbon economy. We want COP26 to bring all countries together to increase climate ambition, to promote a clean, green recovery from the pandemic and uphold the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We want all countries to come forward with ambitious, nationally determined contributions and long-term strategies to reach zero carbon emissions as soon as possible, and to help adapt to climate change and support others to do the same, with increased finance commitments totaling more than $100 billion. We also want businesses and other organisations to make commitments to net zero. It's vital that we all recognise the role that we all need to play in this. Rather like coronavirus, the effects of climate change tend not to recognise national boundaries, they tend not to carry passports. And so it's vital that we all act together now. And today's session will help to explain why. So before I hand over to uh, the, the, the star guest. Uh, I'd just like to thank our presenter, Professor Ralph Toomey, uh, who is co-director of the Grantham Institute uh, for Climate Change and the Environment at Imperial College London, uh, for agreeing to talk to us today. Uh, and my thanks to, to the excellent Polish and British scientists who are joining us and who have kindly agreed to join the discussion that will follow to help provide their expert insights. I'm looking forward to hearing more about what the changing weather means for us and what we should all expect in the future. And thank you very much to you all for your support in helping to make that future more positive through our actions. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrzej Kassenberg, and I represent the Institute for Sustainable Development. Our institute has been in place for 30 years, and we have been um, advocating the future of generations to come. We believe that what we do today is for the sake of our grandchildren and their children. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, James Hughes or um, 
largely the British Embassy in Warsaw for organizing and hosting this session. And I would like to uh, thank uh, all the guests who agreed to speak today. Uh, Professor Ralph Tory from UK, Professor Hayley Fowler, Dr. James Grayley, also from the UK, and um, Professor Zbigniew Karachum, and, and Dr. Matuszewska. However, first of all, I would like to um, reach out to our audience and I would like to encourage you to ask questions and offer your comments that will help us all better understand and appreciate the magnitude of the problems triggered by the climate change. I would like to thank you up front for completing the questionnaire. Uh, over 70 people completed the registration questionnaire. This is important input and I would be also very grateful if you take on the same effort at the end of this session. We will have a link at the chat window that will take you to the survey. And as a result, we will uh, sort of pick, your mind, pick your brain to know what you think about the outcome of this meeting. And let me also explain that the project is also supported by the Life Unify project and by the uh, National Environmental Fund. So, what is the plan for today? We will start with uh, the um, opening intervention by Professor Ralph uh, Tuomi. And uh, after that, I will invite Polish and uh, the UK experts uh, to offer their comments. And right after that, we will invite our internet audience to engage. So uh, depending on how the discussion unfolds, I will um, actually run the summaries and I will ask our expert guests uh, to comment or I will actually address questions to specific speakers. And at the end, uh, we will have a short wrap up that I will provide. But the question is why we have decided to tackle this uh, problem together with uh, the British Embassy in Warsaw. Uh, what do environment tells us today? Well, back in the 1990s, before the framework convention, we talk about the risks, about the global warming, etc. Today, we have a different language. We speak there is a climate crisis. Uh, some people claim that it's going to be a climate disaster. So what has happened? The 2020 has been the warmest year in the North Hemisphere. The temperature was up by 1.21 uh, degrees Celsius. And we've been uh, tracking these measurements for the past uh, 140 years. Uh, it was agreed in Paris a few years ago that uh, we should not uh, go allow the temperature go up by more than 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius, and we are about to reach that. It seems that uh, this is the key point. From 2017, we had the warmest years ever, and this uh, is true across the globe, at all continents. If you look at the, um, the Pacific Ocean, uh, Goni uh, Typhoon, reach this uh, velocity of 317 kilometers per hour. So this is a hyper hurricane. And Antonio uh, Guterres, the UN secretary, has recently spoke about the very concerning issues. And the report that was presented implies that despite the science tells us that by 2030, we should reduce by 45% our greenhouse emissions, uh, it appears that the practical measures that have been implemented will generate only 1% reduction. So this is not a reasonable solution. And the very fact that we have the pandemic and therefore uh, emissions went down by 6 to 7 percent, it doesn't mean that once the pandemic is over, we will revisit or we'll get back on the, on the previous track of uh, emissions. Uh, the UK and Poland uh, are facing their own challenges regarding the climate, but uh, there are other countries that are tremendously affected. Take Syria in 2017. 
um, they had a tremendous drop that uh, also triggered uh, migration of people to Europe. And the Deputy Minister of the Environment of Syria claims that this is our land. It was given to us by God. We don't want to leave that land. And the level of ocean has been going up. The Maldives government had a special meeting underwater in special suits. And they claim that this is what future um, brings to us. And um, the highest um, elevation at uh, Maldives Islands is 1.2 meters above uh, uh, above the level of the sea. What really speaks to me is uh, the youth uh, climate strike. And one of the schools in the UK claimed that you are going to die peacefully and we will live in a nightmare. So what is this nightmare like? What is the truth? And how does that manifest itself in our daily life? Perhaps we tend to live in a bubble. Perhaps uh, we are blindfolded and we are not able to see what happens outside the bubble. We work, we consume, and we tend to our business and we don't notice that the real world keeps changing and that can hit us as a real threat. Or perhaps it's all exaggerated. So what's the actual situation? Hence, we invited Professor Ralph um, Tuomi, who's the vice director of the Institute for Climate Change and Environment. He's a graduate of Cambridge and he serves as, a, as an advisor in an important institution namely Climate Geek. And the most important thing is that he has been an author and a reviewer for the WHO reports or IPCC reports, which is uh, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. Right now, Professor Tuomi leads the group that uh, investigates tropical twisters that tend to come to Europe. Ralph, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so I will talk to you about uh, climate and weather. So just some basic ideas about uh, the difference between climate and weather. I think it's maybe quite important when people talk about extreme weather. So the, um, the basic idea behind climate or oh, a uh, common saying is climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. And when you talk about extreme weather, we are really concerned about uh, extreme events. Sorry, we're really concerned about weather, um, not really about climate. So, so what do I mean by that? So when we talk about climate, a good analogy might be that I know the climate in the summer is different from the climate in the winter. So when I'm in the summer, I'm expecting it to be warm. In the winter, I'm expecting it to be, to be cold. That doesn't really tell me this year what exactly is going to happen in the summer. But I am confident that the summer will be warmer than it is now. And why am I so confident? It's because the boundary conditions are given by the sun, by the position of the sun. And similarly, we have this idea about climate change. And what's basically happened is the boundary condition, which is one of the variables in the climate system, the CO2, has changed. And that's changed the energy in the system. So that's the basic idea of the greenhouse effect. And that's the basic idea of climate. So if you put CO2 in the atmosphere, the climate will change. So this is beyond dispute. What we then talk about is, well, what happens? So what actually happens this summer or next summer? And that, of course, becomes a, a weather event. And if you look into any extreme event, you look at the weather forecast. And these days, they are normally predicted quite well. It could be a flood in Australia. It could be a hurricane. So the process itself isn't really a surprise. It's, it's something we understand from, from we can predict very well these days. So we fully understand the physics behind behind the event but if you want to ask well is this because of climate change which is a common question then that becomes more difficult 
And so there's a whole activity around what, what people in the field call attribution. So can I say that this event was due to climate change? This turns out to be quite difficult, a lot more difficult. So when we talk about climate, we say, well, we should really be considering average. So I can look at maybe 20, 30 years of weather, and then I can tell you, yes, this climate is definitely different to the last climate. If I'm looking at a single flood, that becomes a lot more difficult because I really need 20, 30 years of data to say anything about climate as such. Nevertheless, we know there are certain physics, certain rules of the game. So if you think about uh, any given weather or extreme event, it is a bit like rolling the dice. So to have an extreme flood or an extreme heat wave, it's a bit like rolling the dice and you need to roll six, maybe five times in a row. So there's a probability attached to it, which is normally very low. That's why we consider it an extreme event, extreme weather. It's not something that happens every day. So it's a combination of factors like rolling the dice, which in the end, everything lines up and I have my extreme event. And what we are doing basically by putting CO2 in the atmosphere is we are changing the dice. We are manipulating the rolling of the dice. So we are doing two things. We are increasing the amount of moisture that is in the atmosphere. So any given storm these days, compared to maybe 50 years ago, just has there's just more moisture available. Why is there more moisture available? Because it's warmer, and warm air can hold more moisture before it condenses. So this is what we call also the relative humidity, which is the amount of moisture relative to the moisture if it was completely um, what we call saturated or in equilibrium. So the air, if you look at the up in the sky, if you look at the cloud base, the base of the cloud, that's what we call saturated. And everything below that is not saturated. And if the air warms below the cloud level, it will hold more moisture, which means by the time it goes into the clouds, there will be more liquid water. And liquid water, of course, is what causes all the floods and, and so forth. So we know if it's going to be warmer, there's going to be more moisture. More moisture means it sh the floods will get, uh, there will be just more water. So that's one thing we, we, we know. So that's just basic physics. The other thing we also know that if you change the average temperature, you will also change the extreme temperature. And so why, why, why do we know that? Because it turns out that uh, if you think about rolling the dice and, and working out uh, what is the likelihood of all sorts of events happening? We, we have these uh, things we call probability distributions. So the, that define how likely something is. So how likely is it that Warsaw will be 40 degrees for three days? So I can look at the, all the historical data and then from that data estimate by probability, how likely is it that I can have three days in Warsaw over 40 degrees? And what we find is if the average temperature changes, then what we call the tail, this, this very, very warm event that might happen, changes a lot. In fact, it changes a lot more than the average. And this is just a consequence of basic uh, statistics. So what we call the tail, the low end of the probability or the high end of the probability, very, very sensitive to small changes in the mean. So this can be shown very simply mathematically. So if you just change the average a little bit, the, the extreme changes a lot. And in fact, there's a strong dependence on this tail. And uh, there's even a, an idea that if you understand your extremes very well, so if I really know what a 40, the probability of a 40-year event in Warsaw is, I know exactly what the average temperature in Warsaw is. Because this, this number is so sensitive, if I understand it very well, and it's so sensitive to my average, that if I know that number well, the average I know very well. Of course, that's not how we work. We work by calculating lots and lots of numbers and then doing the average. Everybody can do average. Everybody's done it at school. So that's what we do when we don't really not have enough data for these extremes. And that's the other problem, data. So to make statements about changes in extremes, we don't need the average temperature. We need the number of extreme events, and we need to say that they have changed. But by, by, by definition, they don't happen very often. So a 50-year flood, which is what's happening in Australia at the moment or where, wherever, by definition, on average, happens every 50 years. So if you have 100 years of carefully collected meteorological data in your weather station, you're not going to see many events like that. That's the whole definition of this extreme event.
So it's very hard for us to understand or be sure that these extremes have changed. So then what do we do? We turn to models. So these are climate models. So the beauty of these models is that we can run them many, many, many times. So we can generate a thousand years of model simulations just by running them on the computer. The problem is we then depend on the model to simulate the extreme events. And there they also have a problem. So, um, for example, if you think uh, tropical cyclones, hurricanes, which is my area, the climate models don't actually simulate hurricanes, certainly strong hurricanes very well. Because the, to simulate a hurricane, you need to really look at all the detailed uh, processes. You need a, a grid or we, we call a horizontal resolution on the model of maybe four kilometer. So that needs to be the grid on which you calculate all your equations. But a typical climate model is only maybe 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers. So that makes it very hard for the climate model. But that's what we need. For extreme events, we need high resolution climate models, and there are not many. So we need a high resolution climate model, and we need to run it for a long, long time. So these are the challenges in extreme weather, which is why when you hear scientists talking and interviewed about extreme events and weather, they will actually be normally quite cautious because you say, yes, you can talk about the global average temperature just we heard in the introduction. And that's that's quite a, a useful number. On, but in some sense, it's not very useful because nobody really experiences the global average temperature. It's a theoretical concept, which is from a scientific point of view, easy to understand and explain. But then you and they say, yes, is, it, is the global warming going to continue? Absolutely. I think we are quite confident about the global average temperature. But then people want to know about local. They want to know the weather in Warsaw, the hurricane in Puerto Rico, the, uh, the flood in, uh, in Sydney. And then you need local data. You need high resolution models. So this becomes a much, much harder problem. And then scientists will, will say, well, these are the sort of things we expect, but we cannot be sure that this event is definitely because of climate change. There are actually one or two exceptions, though. So there is the case of Hurricane Sandy, which is an interesting um, case. So Hurricane Sandy was a huge storm, which caused a lot of damage in New York by what we call storm surge. So this was the, the winds push the water into New York and cause a lot of flooding into the underground and the, the underground system and, the, and, and, and a lot of power stations and lots of things. And then people ask the question, well, how, was this due to climate change? And what they said was, well, maybe a third of it was climate change. You say, well, why did they come up with a third? Because some of the damage was caused by the sea level rise, because some of the overtopping of the the sea defenses was because the sea level was rising. And we are quite confident because the sea level is responding very slowly to global warming, really is responding to global warming. We are quite confident that the sea level change is due to climate change. So that bit, they could say, yeah, that's definitely due to climate change. But the storm itself, they weren't so sure because these storms happen all the time. So in that case, you could say there is a long-term consequence of sea level rise, and this is causing causing the damage. So it's a it's a difficult um, difficult challenge to to attribute individual events. So, but we can say is that we are basically rolling the dice differently. Every time we have a combination of factors, we are making and they involve more heat, more temperature, or more water we are basically, we have increased the chances of, um, of flooding and heat waves. And that's all we can say at the moment. And that's a very, um, very useful um, rule of thumb, if you like, if you listen to the media and, and the news stories. So that maybe um, describes some of the sort of science backgrounds and some of the, some of the, the challenges around weather. So I look forward to any questions and discussions around the, if you like, the physics of, of that. Um, but let me make one other point, And that's what actually most people are concerned about isn't actually the weather, it's actually disasters. And then if you consider disasters, the disasters isn't just about the weather, the disaster is also what we call um, about the vulnerability. So there's a question of 
where exactly is the extreme weather happening and were were the community prepared was the building prepared was it built properly so in terms of a disaster you also need to ask the question is the community is the building actually being built properly and of course if you say you have more frequent events that question is going to be asked more of, often so the infrastructure is going to be tested more often people are going to be tested more often and just like with this pandemic if you test and you ask the question what you inevitably find is the people losing are the people who have no resources is the people in developing countries who are building uh, much worse standards than uh, than in, in Europe or in North America. So the same event which might happen in Europe will maybe cause a, a minor problem will cause a disaster somewhere else. So if you take the leap from weather to disaster, you have to bear in mind the question about uh, your response and the societal response, the uh, the ability to respond, the infrastructure, the amount of resources in preparing for disaster. Let me give you another example. One of the biggest ways of dealing with disaster is what we call early warning systems. So an early warning system isn't just a weather forecast. It is also actions based on the warnings. And the action could be that you build better or the action could be that you evacuate. And a, a, if I can give you examples again from my own research, a tropical cyclone, the worst tropical cyclone disaster that has happened in the recent past was in is in Burma, Myanmar. Over a hundred thousand people died uh, in tropical cyclone made land. This cyclone, in fact, was forecasted by many many meteorological agencies. So we have satellites, we can track cyclones, we have models that can predict them. So the cyclones were predicted three, four days in advance. But the warning system failed, not because of the weather forecast, because the warning system includes communication to the public. And the public were not warned adequately. They were not evacuated, and so they were unaware. So you have a disaster on a scale of 100,000 deaths, which used to happen frequently in Bangladesh and in many other countries, and now thankfully does not happen. A very good example was in India. In India, there was a, a cyclone that made landfall in the 90s, killed uh, 20,000 people. An almost identical cyclone from a meteorological perspective uh, made landfall in very, very similar location 20 years later. And there, 10 people estimate died. So they've gone from 20,000 people to 10 people purely because they used a weather forecast they had a disaster management system, they saved lives, and they got out of harm's way. Of course, the physical damage was still considerable. But it shows you that actually the step from weather and climate to disasters isn't just about the weather. It's also about preparing society. So it's also about social justice, about governance, and, and, and uh, topics like that. So there's a, there is a political element to that as well. So I think that concludes everything I wanted to say about climate and, and weather. So I'll look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Ralf. I think it's been a very interesting uh, uh, viewpoint of a scientist who is very conservative when it comes to defining different issues. But what seems very important here is that, uh, if I may quote your example of the dice, this is not only um, a question of probability, because um, more and more often we throw six on the dice, and this is crucial. We have to be aware of that. And also, Ralph has also mentioned uh, being prepared in terms of awareness and organization. Namely, being prepared, being adapted. Should we focus on curbing greenhouse gases emission, or should we um, focus on getting ready 
we should focus on both, but the question is whether we have resources for that, whether we have enough. Uh, I would like to give the floor now to the next speaker, Haile Fowler. Professor, you deal with uh, climate change in the School of Eng uh, Engineering at Newcastle University. And in your research, you focus on uh, water, uh, precipitation, drought, floodings, and related models. She has also co authored uh, a report by uh, IPCC and also Br the British report. Haile, the floor is yours. Um, thanks very much. I'm hoping you can all hear me. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I suppose I, I have a similar background to the previous speaker, but also a slightly different background. Um, so I look at both the science of climate change, but also look at the, um, the decisions we need to make as a society. Um, and how we change guidance to actually deal with um, the sort of extremes we're going to see in the future. So I look at things very much from an engineering perspective, um, and I'm part of an engineering school at Newcastle University. Um, and I'd firstly like to agree with, with everything that, uh, that Ralph said so far. Um, we really need to be thinking about much more frequent extreme weather events in the future, um, much more um, intense extreme weather events. So my particular um, expertise is in extreme rainfall um, and flooding, in particular flash floods, and I've done, I've done a lot of research in this area. And I think it's true to say that as the atmosphere warms, it holds more moisture and therefore we can expect these extreme rainfall events to be more intense, but perhaps also bigger um, and with greater volume and therefore have more impact in terms of flooding events. Um, at the same time, we'll see more sporadic rainfall perhaps. And so we get this kind of irony of more drought events and more flood events at the same time, um, together with warmer temperatures, um, obviously, with global warming and more heat extremes for us to deal with as well. Um, and I think what, what's important really in thinking about um, these extreme weather events um, is, is both understanding what the future will bring in terms of the science and understanding the potential changes in those probabilities, understanding the potential changes to the characteristics of events that matter for, for making um, but for making our society robust to those extremes. So in terms of what character, what, what changes in the characteristics matter. So it might be that we, we use, for example, peak intensities of rainfall to design surface water drainage systems. Um, we, we also use something called the probable maximum precipitation. We estimate that. Um, we probably don't do it very well at the moment. And, you know, do we understand things now that we perhaps didn't understand in the past? And do we need to revise those estimates for dam designs, um, and you know, um, how will this these these volumetric changes in extreme weather events matter for future catchment management, um, and how do we manage droughts and floods together in the future? You know, can we actually um, produce new infrastructure systems that that enable us to manage droughts and floods more effectively by trapping the water? Um, from floods and using that to, to manage these drier summer periods that we might see in a warmer climate. So I think um, there's, there's a lot to think about and, and you know, um, we need to really be reducing our emissions as much as possible, um, as fast as possible, and trying to reach that net zero target um, that certainly um, we've talked about um, a lot um, in terms of Trying to trying to stick to the two degrees targets in the Paris Agreement, um, and at the moment we're of course um, with the pledges that um, countries have nationally um, decided on. Um, 
set to well overshoot that target by the end of the century um, with something like 3.5 degrees of warming with the current pledges. So we really need to be thinking about reducing emissions, but at the same time, we can't avoid the inevitable changes that will come with, with the warming we all see anyway. And therefore, we also need to adapt to extreme weather events that we see now, which may be bigger and more intense, but also the potential for um, unknown um, and uncertain extremes that we may not have seen before. Um, and I think that's something that would be interesting to discuss as well. So I'm happy to finish there with my opening remarks. Thank you. I think that what Professor Fowler has said and what, what we keep saying that we should curb the emissions, we should get ready, we should be prepared. Uh, but also what matters here is that we have to change our approach to many solutions. Uh, let me give you a short example. A few years ago, there was a flash flood uh, in Warsaw and the, 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 the Warsaw underground was flooded. And um, the city had to face a lot of criticism from the press, uh, which said that the city wasn't prepared at all. But the city was very well prepared because the, the drainage system was uh, um, very much uh, compliant with the law. So we have to be prepared and uh, there have to be changes, changes, because otherwise, well, the climate will keep changing. But if we change, the, the climate change will be, be will take place slower. Uh, now, let me give the floor to Ms. Uh, Matuszewska, the next speaker. She's a PhD uh, in the Public Health Institute the hygiene department. She, used, she was the head of a team which dealt with the link between health and climate. And this project was financed by uh, the National Environmental Fund and the Ministry of Health. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for, for, for this introduction. And uh, now I would like to address a different aspect related to climate change. It's a very broad term. It covers sudden and unexpected weather events, among other things. And uh, this project by the National Public Health Institute was also related to how it affects our health and whether these changes are important in the context of the number of deaths or people being admitted to hospitals. And the, we might say, when well, speaking about the findings of the project, we might say that Poland is not a country with frequent extreme weather events, but th 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 there are so uh, there are there are such events in Poland anyway, but not the the, the increase in and their consequences ha hasn't been uh, that significant. And however, I would like to comment on a different aspect that has not been given that much attention, namely the changes that we see and that are associated with uh, prevalence of certain pathogens which may affect human health. Imagine extreme events such as uh, floods may generate water aerosol. Water aerosol may include various pathogens that can pose a threat to human life. For instance, Legionella is a good example. Whenever there is a 
flood and uh, heavy rainfall. And then we've got a city infrastructure that may cause the splash of water arousal by the cars. It may lead to the situation that uh, the bacteria uh, will uh, be prevalent in the air and therefore it may pose a threat to people. Another good example that uh, is really true for many European countries, namely the change in water temperature, seawater and coastal water. Again, we see the growth of microorganisms that uh, had never been a risk to people. But these days, we see that with the raising temperatures of water, especially surface water, these microorganisms can grow. For instance, the Vibria bacteria. And uh, these uh, developments are reflected in the newly adopted or revised regulations. Currently, the directive on bathing sites is um, undergoing a review and the, the WHO experts point out that with the climate change, we should uh, revise our quality control approach and we sh and while evaluating the risk we should look for the pathogens that uh, have not been present before but they may actually emerge with the climate change and may pose a risk to human population and the same um, refers to the drinking water. We observe the climate change unfolding before our eyes. Therefore, we should start uh, predicting new microbiological risks that may emerge in our environment. And that also brings us to physical and chemical factors and uh, anthropogenic uh, factors. So all these things that um, we see with the smoke being so pervasive and which is generated by the human activity and which is obviously implicated in the climate change. The project uh, has also made it very clear that the climate change is a very broad topic. It has a lot of different dimensions. And uh, we need to pay attention not only to the direct association with anthropogenic activities of a human race, but we should also look at things that uh, emerge in, in our immediate environment and may affect the public health. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think that doctor um, actually drew our attention to a different aspect, namely the health risk or public health risk that emerges with the climate change. Poland and the UK have moderate climate. And uh, obviously these um, issues are important, but not as important as in the tropical regions. Uh, right now, I would like to turn to Dr. James Grivier, who's um, with the European Health and Environment Center. So he also works with or deals with health and uh, he's also affiliated with the Jagiellonian University in Poland so perhaps he will be speaking Polish that would be uh, very nice and he investigates the links between the environment and epidemic and his focus is the negative adverse effect that uh, environmental factors have on human health. James, over to you. Uh, I will continue now. Sorry, I started without being able to see the microphone. Um, so I was saying, I'm, I'm an environmental epidemiologist. So my interests are trying to understand the links between uh, things which happen in our environment and health of human populations. Um, 
I'm particularly interested in the way that vulnerabilities of certain populations moderate those effects. And I'm also very interested in how risks related to environmental stressors are communicated to people. And I think that this is a this has already been spoken about by both Dr. Matoshevska and, and others. Um, what, what we see is that uh, we, we need to be um, thinking about our preparedness and mitigation strategies and all of these things which require a personal and, and a political engagement with climate change and extreme weather events. And it's crucial that we communicate risk in a way which is meaningful to people so that we can build up this momentum towards um, having a meaningful political impact and, and uh, the, we, we mitigate climate change. Um, now, climate change has been described as a, as a wicked issue. And what's often meant by that is it's very hard to control. It's characterized by all kinds of uncertainties. And it's, um, it's an area in which there are a lot of vested interests, different kinds of stakeholders with often with different levels of power. And the effects of climate change occur very differently over different um, areas of the globe and of course also over time. Now the reason that I'm talking about this even though we've been talking about extreme weather events is because as uh, as Professor Tommy talked about at the beginning um, attribution is quite good between extreme weather events and climate with relation to some things like temperature, heat waves and so on. And also in the health sphere, we see quite good work done relating health and um, extreme heat events. But what we don't often see is joining up from um, the impacts on health or the economy going all the way back to that uh, anthropogenic climate change. And there are some reasons why that's important to think about this, this kind of large causal chain, which goes all the way from those drivers to the end impacts. Um, we shouldn't imagine that the meteorological event is the impact. The impact is on people's livelihoods, on their health, on economics, migration, and all of the things that that controls. And in spite of everything that we're learning about climate change, it's actually slipping down the public's uh, agenda in terms of what they consider to be important. So what I would argue for is that um, scientists and they are doing this but they should increasingly be working together to try to, um, to, to to really explore these issues between the end impacts and the the extreme weather events and then the climate drivers um, using a kind of complex um, systems approach and there's two reasons why I think that can be really useful one of those is because if we draw out this complicated web, of influences between climate drivers and the, 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 the impacts at the end on our health and our, our e economies and so on, um, it allows us to identify co-benefits. And there's a reason why this is important. Those co-benefits could be um, exactly the things which I've talked about. It could be the positive effect on our health and the positive effect on jobs, for example or on development or on the benevolence of a society um, of, of conducting mitigating actions. Um, and one of the reasons why co-benefits are very important, telling people if you mitigate climate change, our economy will benefit or the development of the country will benefit, is because fear has largely been shown not to work very well. If we market uh, to the public and to policymakers, the idea that climate change is something to be feared, this can play this can play out in quite some uh, different unintended ways, which don't necessarily result in people being motivated to mitigate climate change. Um, what we need to perhaps also think about then are side effects, and if you start drawing out a complex causal chain from the drivers all the way through to these end impacts we start to be able to identify a lot of unintended consequences, these side effects of making certain kinds of interventions. And this can be really extremely important 
when we're trying to consider that the, the differences in impact over different geographical and temporal scales. Um, one of the things which has already been raised is that there's very little um, consideration of what's really going on in lower and middle income countries in terms of the impacts, um, particularly on health. And as has been raised also today, one of the reasons for that is a, is, is a lack of data. Um, <clears throat> what we know about the, the motivations behind people to mitigate climate change largely comes from studies done um, by environmental psychologists and others in the developed world. So we really need to start shifting our thinking towards um, working in a complex way, but not only in our comfort zone geographically. We need to um, start thinking about these unintended consequences and the best ways of communicating the dangers of extreme weather events and climate change, um, not only to our nearest neighbours, but also um, across different cultures and continents. So I, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Dziękuję serdecznie, James. Sądzę, że Thank you very much, James. I think that uh, the key thing is um, well, the bubble that we live in. I mentioned that um, at the beginning. We keep living in the bubble and we lose sight of what is going on beyond that. And it is important, as you said, to communicate that we can do things differently and you can actually have a different lifestyle and we can um, also reset our economy and that may bring a lot of co-benefits, as, as you said, and these co-benefits can be quite uh, tangible. Now, let me turn to Professor Karachun from the Warsaw University of Life Sciences. Uh, he's specializing in environmental policy, in environmental protection, and in climate for agriculture. For years, he has been uh, part of the environmental movement, and uh, he was uh, a co-founder of the Climate Coalition that brings together 26 uh, organizations. And he's a veteran of COPS, so he um, has uh, a lot of different perspectives. Over to you. Thank you, Andre. Um, first, let me thank you for organizing this highly interesting meeting. As James said, science is very important and we have to pay attention what science can bring to the table. And the pandemic proved that to all of us uh, how tricky things become when you ignore what scientists tell you. And the pandemic also made it very clear that you're not able to deal with the crisis without proper science. It's only the science that helped us uh, speed up uh, the production of uh, vaccines and gives us hope for getting back to a normal life. This is the Poland and UK debate, and I was thinking about the cliches that we encore. Regretfully, we are not able to hear you, Zbyszek. Uh, I have a following suggestion. Uh, perhaps you will log into the session again, and meanwhile, we will open the floor for the audience. I do have some comments and questions. Therefore, let us focus on uh, discussion. And let me ask James and Renata. Okay, we need to carry on. So let me take the first question. I believe that this question can be interesting for both James and Renata. What are the new health problems that the healthcare system may uh, 
expect as a result of the increasing extreme weather events. Renata, perhaps you will go first. So what is new for the healthcare systems? I think that there is one thing that we have seen for some years. In my area, there is microbiology and pathogens, uh, namely waterborne pathogens. I believe that uh, here we are going to see major developments. We will see new diseases um, emerging, um, and such new diseases will be caused by the pathogens present in water. So we will see uh, bria um, induced. Uh, infections in Poland and in other countries uh, have research has been going on and we know that uh, there have been single cases of such infections we are also expecting Legionella infections to raise. I believe that this is uh, the challenge that we are going to face in the future, and the pandemic may contribute to that, because it's not, not only the climate change that makes the environment very conducive for this bacteria. In addition to that, we have to remember that these microorganisms tend to um, grow in public buildings that have been shut down for many months now because of the pandemic and therefore a lot of installations have been sitting idle, for instance, the water supply systems. And such a stagnant condition is very conducive to the bacteria growth, especially these bacteria. Now, another set of challenges may be caused by the pathogens that are um, born by vectors such as ticks or mosquitoes. And again, because of the climate change, we expect to see in certain regions and among certain populations emergence of such conditions. We may also expect to see new pathogens to emerge. But in addition to that, we will probably see more cases of infections and diseases that had have been fairly rare so far. So these, is, these are things that we may expect in the future. There is an additional question that is a follow-up to that, namely, what diseases can be uh, considered to be conditioned or triggered by the climate change? So, I think that Dr. Matuszewska has already given a good account of the, the kinds of infectious diseases and, and pathogen-related diseases which will be um, increasing as a result of extreme weather events. Um, perhaps one of the most uh, clearly attributed extreme weather-related health impacts is, um, is heat stress. Now, you have acute heat stress, which people experience um, when they have too much time in, in high temperatures over a short period, and this can lead to exhaustion and, and even death in the infirm. But of, of course, um, you also have longer term effects which relate to that increased heat, uh, which are things related to largely cardiovascular mortality. So strokes, heart attacks, uh, all, all of these um, health outcomes are attributable to, uh, to extreme heat. But one thing I would say though, is that other things which relate to heat, for example, wildfires um, and, and uh, long periods of dry episodes, so droughts and so on, these can all result in air pollution. And then all of those impacts on health, which we expect to have from air pollution can also uh, be um, an impact. So we're looking then at diseases of uh, not only cardiovascular diseases, but also related to our respiratory health um, and cancers and many other diseases that relate to that. And why this is important is because it may be more effective in getting people to think about climate change effects and impacts in terms of air pollution, which is a ta very tangible thing that people can relate to, than perhaps what sometimes feels like a distant concern related to global climate change. 
Thank you. Uh, I can see that Professor Karachun is back. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry for the technical glitch, which always happens nowadays. I've been discussing the role and the importance of science, uh, uh, which has been made clear during the pandemic, because uh, at the beginning, um, politicians ignored the scientists who had been warning about the pandemic and the effects of, of it we can all experience now. And on the other hand, science, thanks to science, uh, we have been able to develop a vaccine in a relatively short time to prevent further um, consequences of the disaster and to go back to the normal as soon as possible. Um, let me uh, comment on what Ralph has uh, mentioned on uh, the heat waves, potential heat waves in Warsaw. There are forecasts in Warsaw which we have made which say that between 2041 2070, the number of of heat waves with over 30 degrees, uh, three day heat waves will go up by about 280% compared to what's going on now. So this shows the, the scale of the threat, which can be brought about by climate change, which uh, this will also have an, an effect of our, on our health and um, the quality of life. But uh, my expertise is, in, is agriculture, and this is a very important aspect for climate change, because agriculture and farming is totally dependent on climate, on precipitation, on uh, the length of vegetation, uh, whether we have um, temperatures below zero or maximum temperatures. These are all factors which uh, have an effect on, on the security of, of food supply. We have to be prepared for that. And in Poland, farming will change because of that, because probably we'll, we won't be able to, to grow potatoes anymore because the climate will be too uh, too warm, there will be not enough water. We will have to switch to corn, which has already been happening because uh, 50 years ago in Poland there was only uh, one tiny region which was uh, uh, fit for, for cor corn. Now we can grow corn anywhere in Poland, but this doesn't mean it will be safer. The consequences of climate change uh, lead to more insecurity in farming. There's a good example. It's, um, it's orchards because this is very dependent on uh, temperatures and the length of vegetation because we uh, uh, in 2007 the vegetation period started in in february so very soon and then in march uh, we had temperatures below zero and Mm, farmers uh, picked uh, three times fewer apples than before, than, than usually. Then we had a year where um, the vegetation per period again started earlier, there were no temperatures below zero afterwards, and the, mm, the year was about 70% higher than average. So this led to a total drop uh, in prices and farmers just uh, threw away about 1 million tons of um, fruit because it just didn't pay to pick it up. So we can see that on the one hand we have uh, the extreme weather events which are dangerous to, to us. Uh, clearly uh, there is a public health aspect but also there is this uh, food security aspect. Uh, this is also related to um, health safety because uh, new diseases, new t types of pests will pose a threat to farming. We already have new pathogens which attack corn, for instance, in Poland. Uh, we didn't have this problem in the past because it was too cold, but now this pest is capable of destroying 100% of, of corn in the field. We have the blue tongue disease uh, uh, in cattle, which is very, very dangerous 
for, for farming animals, and uh, this disease has been developing very quickly in Poland. Uh, these are just a few examples, and uh, this clearly proves that we need to be able to develop and address solutions which will help us curb greenhouse gases emissions, but on the other hand, we have to be able to adapt farming to um, both these extreme weather events and uh, the, the lack of stability of weather. So much from me. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question here, which I think is very important. Climate change uh, leads to what is stress? What is the, what are the symptoms of water stress, and what are the consequences? Because uh, temperature will keep rising and faster than now, and where the consequences of, of the water stress will be the most um, the harshest ones. So, um, Professor Howley, could you address this question and later on maybe Zbyszek? Highly, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess there's quite a bit of uncertainty around where the greatest water stress will be felt in the future. Um, and I think it's particularly um, not necessarily always related to the biggest changes in climate, actually, but something we've been talking about during this meeting today about where people actually have adaptive capacity. So by that, I mean the sort of the economic and social structures and um, just the economic ability through um, GDP to actually enable them to, to cope with, with climate changes. Um, so I, I think we can expect to see the biggest water stresses in the sort of locations where we already see them today. Um, and that would be in these poorer um, economic countries and particularly countries where there are conflicts already um, and breakdown of social and political systems. Um, and obviously all of those um, aspects exacerbate current climate variability and then um, change moving forwards. Um, and I know there's already been some talk about, um, you know, potential changes in the tropics. Um, and I think, I think in particular, some of those areas may see um, bigger water stresses in the future, um, but also in the mid latitudes as well. And I'm particularly thinking of Europe. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of evidence from, from climate model projections for the future suggesting that the Mediterranean in particular um, will show um, quite well there will be quite a large drying in the future um, and and particularly obviously in the in the dry season at the moment um, but there'll also be a lot more um, storms potentially um, in the autumn in the future so I mean I think it's very difficult to say where the biggest water stresses will be felt in the future. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty coming from, um, from climate models. Um, and even if you look over Europe, um, we're, we're expecting it on average um, there to be, um, I suppose, drier conditions on average across the southern half of Europe and wetter conditions on average across the northern half. But where that falls exactly, that line really depends on what climate model you're looking at, how far into the future, and how, what the climate sensitivity is in terms of, you know, the, the um, potential for warming um, compared to the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, to just put it simply. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, but, but I, think, I think key here is um, the ability for countries to actually cope with the stresses that are coming. Um, and in particular, I think that even those countries that will, on average, experience um, reduced water um, rainfall in the future um, are expected to actually receive that rainfall in much shorter, more intense bursts. And therefore, we can expect um, the potential for flash flooding to increase everywhere. And I think that's something that's key here as well, is how do we manage these um, you know, perhaps these, these drier periods, this water stress, um, 
in terms of supplies and supplies to agriculture and industry as well, but together with that potential for, for flooding. Thank you. So Zbyszek, I'll give you the floor. Could you please comment and to make it easier, I, I will ask another question. Uh, how does it affect uh, biological diversity? Because we protect species, but can we afford the protection given these ch climate changes? Let me start with the water stress, because this is an important aspect for farming, which is my expertise. Farming uses about 70% of water, uh, of drink, drinking water supplies, because without water supplies in many parts of the world, uh, farming is simply not possible. So we have to supply water to plants and uh, animals. And water uh, is increasingly limiting uh, farming. Uh, take California, take Chile, uh, take uh, Southern Europe, Spain, Italy. Farming without irrigation is uh, impossible. And climate change will make farming even more and more dependent on artificial water supply because temperatures will draw, wind will be more intense. So uh, this has an effect on transpiration. This means that more moisture will uh, be released from um, soil. Poland is a good example because we have relatively small uh, water supplies uh, per year. And even uh, the, the slightest change uh, in the speed of uh, evaporation can have a very strong effect on farming. We have had uh, a permanent drought in farming for a couple of years now in, in different re uh, regions of Poland. In 2018, 19 were the driest years ever over the last 100 years. So it has become a serious issue also for food security. Uh, there has been a research project in Poland. It shows that uh, farming has uh, suffered a loss of about 20, 25 percent of, of the harvest per year because of drought. So this is very important um, quantity. This is a lot, actually. Are we able to uh, adapt? Well, this is an, uh, uh, something we are uncertain about, as Haley has said, because there are more and more examples of, of, let's say, uh, coastline areas where water, um, sea water has been passing to, to the soil increasingly, which uh, alters the, the, the chemical composition of underground waters, which has an effect on farming. So uh, it will be um, more and more difficult to use this water for drinking purposes. So we will have to be able to resort to uh, desalting sea water. But this will be more costly for farming, for the price of food, and we will have to use more energy. So this can also have a negative effect on, on the climate. So this is something worth mentioning and bearing in mind here. But as a matter of fact, we don't have uh, a lot of um, research on that. But there are estimates. Uh, from tropical areas, which show that, uh, let's say, in Central Africa, harvest will go down increasingly if if you re if even with a slight reduction of water supply. So this is a serious consequence because this might lead to food shortages to about 200 million people on the continent. Uh, does it affect the diversity? Certainly so, because uh, uh, in Poland now there are water shortages which have has 
have had an effect on on forests in Poland because pine has been disappearing. This is because of temperatures, but also this is because of water. And the, because of the fact that underground water has been going down, I mean, its level. And also, we are concerned about um, other types of trees. Uh, um, well, pines are affected by water and by pests. We have new kinds of pests which now attacks pine. This is a very aggressive um, species of pest, and about 60% of our um, trees in Poland are pines. So this is important. So this is the effect it will have on uh, on biodiversity. And let me mention also something which hasn't been much talked about in the recent years, My, uh, meaning the uh, uh, acidity of uh, water, also sea water. This can have an effect on all the trophic changes in oceans, and as a consequence, this might have a very serious effect on biodiversity. Um, and I, I, I'm, I don't mean only the coral reef here, because this has some other effects on the population of, on, of many species. Also, mammals and birds might disappear in the long run because there is not enough food for them. Um, thank you. I think that Zbyszek uh, was going on for quite a while. James, would you like to respond to that? Yes, just to add, I, I completely agree with uh, with the two previous responses. Just to extend that into the health um, world, really. I mean, these impacts in terms of crop yields and the kinds of crops that can be grown and so on, all of this has very direct implications for those who are trying to um, procure nutrition from, from the land. And obviously, uh, once people cease being able to get enough protein in their diets and so on, they start to be malnourished. And even though adults, for example, can probably, um, once they've survived uh, an event of low nutrition, um, developing fetuses and young children tend to have very uh, negative health con consequences as a result of this, this poor nutrition in their early lives. So there's a clear kind of very large inequality here um, for future generations if, if their um, food, uh, if their nutritional resources aren't safeguarded. And with, with respect to the, the ecosystems um, being damaged by extreme events and, and climate change and so on, of course, this links directly into human health and the, the sort of the, 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 the focus now increasingly is to look at this as a planetary issue. So planetary health really linking together those ecosystems and human health as something which is indivisible. And where we try to make solutions for things like flash flooding, um, of course, the engineering behind that is, is still being developed. Um, but really, the development has to be going in the direction that it's, it's not only um, managing uh, the additional water coming in greater intensity over a shorter period, but that it that these these are sustainable solutions and they're equitable, not just geographically, but also over generations and that they're inclusive of all of those different stakeholders who um, have an interest in uh, in use of that water. Um, the direct consequences uh, may be quite small compared to the indirect consequences of malnutrition, subsequently conflict, uh, migration out of conflict areas, um, and then all kinds of other uh, sequelae, which can really um, be extremely uh, damaging, not only to human health, but to then to the environment as well. So a kind of vicious circle. And we need to turn that vicious circle into a, a virtuous circle, I think. Thank you very Thank you. I have another question, but I'm not sure whether it's really appropriate for our session. However, uh, perhaps uh, one of our panelists will take it. 
the question is about the local governments and spatial planning in Poland. Uh, let me also say that we should look at the UK perspective likewise. So what about the urban sprawl and what about infrastructure? Uh, is any of our UK panelists willing to speak about it? What is the preparedness of the UK local governments? And then we, I will ask uh, one of the Polish speakers to comment on that. So is anyone from the UK willing to comment about the preparedness of the local governments in the context of these upcoming uh, events? I think that this is kind of a side question, not really geared towards the topic of this uh, session, but nevertheless, this is what people ask. Uh, or perhaps we will throw this question at the Polish uh, experts. Uh, Zbyszek, perhaps you can go on? Okay, hang on, hang on. I can see that Haley would like to take the floor, and I understand that she will comment on the UK uh, local governments and their preparedness. Haley, over to you. Okay. I mean, it's not really my area of expertise, but um, obviously within within the UK, we have something called the um, Committee on Climate Change, which has um, a an arm which looks at mitigation and a committee that looks at adaptation as well. And that kind of provides the legal framework for, um, for adapting to these extreme weather events in, in the UK, but also to... Um, moving towards our target of net zero now by 2050. So that's the, the UK target. There's a legal framework in place to allow that to happen. Um, in terms of how the local governments fit into that, um, I think there's very much um, not enough preparedness in the UK in terms of adaptation. Um, I think whether this, this is at a, at a national level or at a local level, um, and it's um, very much um, there. There is a cycle of of planning that it that at the national level that is in place, um, which is called the adaptation cycle, and that includes every every seven years, I think it is, a climate change risk assessment, um, and that's at, at a national scale. And it also includes an international dimension as well, which looks at um, systemic risks that come from overseas, for example, um, food supplies, migration, that type of thing from climate change. Um, and, and every seven years that um, is done of the science and the, the risks that to the UK and different sectors in the UK of climate change. And as part of that, um, then the government responds as part of that cycle um, and um, looks at um, pro producing an adaptation plan um, for different sectors. And I think at the moment, the problem is that really um, there's no measurable and specific objectives to that, op op um, that adaptation planning at the national scale. Um, and that means that um, it's not really happening enough. Um, and the adaptation committee um, who are a group of experts in this area and independent of government are actually looking at trying to push that forwards. At the local scale, I think what's happening is that a lot of cities are producing their own plans. Um, and uh, this is really encouraging actually in terms of there's a lot of the major cities in the UK now that are producing their own plans for both um, moving towards net zero, so reducing emissions, greenhouse gas emissions at the local scales of cities, um, working together with lots of partners within the city, including the transport authorities, retail, um, local universities, um, the NHS, for example, because they're big carbon producers, et cetera, et cetera. But alongside that, um, cities are also thinking about producing their own adaptation plans as well. Um, and we're, we're developing one at the moment for Newcastle upon Tyne, where I where I work and live. Um, so I think these things are happening, um, but they're happening slowly, and we probably need to speed up this process somehow. Maybe I can make a comment. I think the UK, in some ways, has been doing this for a very long time, much longer than Poland. But there's a but. The uh, the issue really twenty years ago was 
when you ask local authorities or indeed anybody, well, what, what is climate change? What does it mean? We're confused. We haven't got information. We don't know what to do. So 20 years ago, there was a need for information, knowledge. So they produced climate model outputs and so forth. We then sort of went through a phase of, of a lot of government cuts um, during after the financial crisis. So climate budgets in local authorities were, were decimated. And we are basically left with now a situation where we have registers, we have plans all over the place, and we have very little action. In fact, if you point to any material action that sort of has a climate change label, it, it, the one that keeps coming up, um, I think my UK colleagues will be familiar, is basically the Thames barrier and how, how they have a plan for that. That's sort of the poster child for, for adaptation. That's a national issue. That's not a London issue because it's a national um, risk, really. Uh, so I think the problem is really there's a big step from risk registers, plans, and actually spending money. And a lot of the spending of money needs to meet criteria of cost benefits. So you need a, a, a clear cost benefit analysis and it needs to pass the threshold for government expenditure. So cost benefit then in terms of adaptation becomes quite tricky in terms of avoided losses and sorts of other things, how you would compute it. So I would characterize that the action on adaptation is considerably shorter than the the risk registers and plans, which are obviously very cheap to do. So I think that would be my perspective. Uh, thank you so much. I understand that now I will call on Zbyszek, but I believe that uh, we won't see much difference between the UK and Polar situation in this regard. So let me say that in Poland, we don't see government support for such actions because we see a high level of skepticism four or five years ago, if we were talking to the local government people, they would say that no, climate change is not there. Climate change was not man-made. Now, the attitude has changed, but we don't have uh, good instruments to tackle that. The problem is that the government, central government, delegates more and more uh, responsibilities to the local government. However, the funding doesn't follow. For instance, we do have a low emission programs that should provide a roadmap for um, zero emission goal at the local level, but these plans were developed several years ago. And basically all of them ended up in a drawer and uh, no one has been really implementing that. What we see is that the big cities actually took notice of the impacts of the climate change. Take Warsaw or Gdańsk and the Trite City. They actually developed their own adaptation plans and they start doing something. However, the mitigation measures are um, are slowed down by the lack of the regulatory framework. For instance, the local governments do not have powers to reduce uh, traffic, transportation traffic. So this is hard to actually go ahead with such actions and we are at the very uh, infancy stage when it comes to the action phase at the local government level. Uh, so let me remind you that we have 45 cities in Poland that have a, a city adaptation plan, but Ralph was speaking about the same thing. We do have plans, we, we know what should be done, but we don't do it, or there is no will to do it. Um, unfortunately, we cannot have uh, voice feedback from our audience, but let me read what Anna Hawaden was writing to us. Namely, let me just find the right spot. <laughs> 
Well, there are two fairly long comments, so let me summarize them for the sake of time. A major problem is uh, com comorbidities that we observe. Uh, obviously, we do recognize the water stress and the heat stress, and these are very tangible risks that may have uh, adverse effect on the quality of life. Let me say that uh, if we are not able to take all questions uh, during the session, we will try to follow up on them and we will have uh, the recording of the session on our website and we will also attach uh, answers to questions. There is another question, namely, wh what social groups can be most affected by demographics or by the ge geographic location or by um, age uh, or, or other uh, factors? So which groups are particularly vulnerable? Uh, who would like to answer this question? Please raise your hands. Okay. The, okay. We, we, I see James and Vance Bushak. James, over to you. Well, I I think that um, you can probably say that this depends almost entirely on the on the geographic context, um, and I'm talking about that globally. But uh, what's what's very clear is that there are huge inequalities um, between the health of different. Uh, populations within nations and between nations and those inequalities tend to be very well correlated with people's um, incomes and also their age although the way that wealth or poverty accumulate or decumulate through age profiles of populations depends very much on the situation um, it's probably for climate change, given that we're talking about something which is so long term, it's uh, very clear that um, some of those in inequalities are going to be, uh, the, the, the negative impacts are going to be wreaked by those who haven't actually been born yet. So there's a clear intergenerational equity issue. But I think that you could arguably say um, that typically it's people who come from the least um, the least wealthy part of the population, typically also gender inequalities. So women often tend to suffer more than men for various reasons. Um, and uh, obviously in, in lower and middle income countries, the impacts not only because of the climate being different in those places, but because of their um, vulnerabilities and the lack of various kinds of early warning systems and preparedness and so on, put them in a particularly uh, um, uh, vulnerable position. Zbyszek, over to you. I fully subscribe to what James said. I believe that we will see the distribution of impacts uh, uh, skewed towards uh, low-income countries. Even today, we see that uh, the lowest-income country um, shoulder most uh, burden related to the impacts. But even when we look at the wealthy north, we can tell that the health impacts and the uh, food or uh, nutrition impacts will be mostly affecting people uh, from low income groups. This is quite obvious. People who can afford to pay for health care or who can spend more on buying food will be in a better situation. Poor people will not have access to that, while the, the government uh, healthcare system won't be able to tackle all the health impacts resulting from climate change. So it will be strained and it will not be able to provide sufficient healthcare services to all affected individuals. So I believe that inequalities stemming from the climate change should be highlighted in the discourse. Thank you. Uh, again, let me read one comment that I will summarize. 
we speak about people, but we forget to um, talk about uh, the well-being of our pets, dogs, cats, and the infrastructure that they also need. It should be part of the adaptation plan. In the Kraków adaptation plan, uh, there is a clause that uh, actually covers that. But overall, this is um, completely under the radar. There are examples from the UK, US, or Australia where these things are being highlighted. It seems that it really shows uh, that people are sensitive about it. And in Australia, in Tasmania, during a meeting that I attended, and it was about climate, people were not talking about themselves, but they were talking about what they need to do to uh, take care of their pets during the heat wave. So this question goes to James. Um, the question is about uh, clean transportation zones. Uh, since you are familiar with the Krakow situ situation, uh, would you comment on that, whether this is the right way to go, whether it would really help mitigate the risk of the extreme weather events? James, can you um, take this question? Well, as far as I understand the, the low emission zones in Krakow, this is really about the effects of particulate matter in particular, um, and also a, a general kind of combustion products affecting people's health negatively. Um, I, I don't I don't think that a local level intervention like that is going to have much impact on extreme weather. What I would say is that um, getting people to uh, buy into the idea that having low emissions within a dense city centre um, in Poland is definitely a good thing. Uh, encouraging people to reduce their reliance on um, fossil fuels, which are burnt extensively in southern Poland and particularly in Śląsk or Silesia, um, quite poor quality coal and so on. And it would be nice to think that people's motivations to have clean air would gradually drive Poland away from its um, dependency on uh, fossil fuels, particularly low quality coals. Um, and that would ultimately contribute to its uh, its it having a lower carbon economy and so on, which you know feeds into that whole kind of global system of um, of gradually mitigating climate change. But I, I don't think that a local level um, intervention uh, in Krakow can really have too much of an effect on 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 weather. Um, it's really a smog uh, intervention. Thank you. The next question is about women and children who are the most uh, vulnerable and exposed to natural disasters and health issues. Is there any ongoing research uh, which focuses on, on the sex or gender aspects? Uh, are there any people researching that in the UK about women, researching women and their exposure, their, their vulnerability? Could you address this question, someone? So, there, I can see that James has volunteered. I, I think I heard also uh, Ralph. Yeah, I was just going to say, so the UK has a, a funding stream which is which is just under huge pressure uh, from the overseas development aid um, and some of that is to do with disaster management overseas in, in countries. Um, gender is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a very big issue in terms of um, disaster mitigation. So. Um, I think there's a, there's a very clear understanding of the role of women have in the management of households, in the recovery, post-disaster recovery, uh, in their vulnerability in terms of um, access to resources and 
so there is there is definitely a large um, effort on gender issues and gender inequalities, both in terms of how it impacts women, but also how women are part of the solution. And I was talking about the early warning systems, and for, for example. So I think this is well understood, and there is definitely research on this, and it's a recognized um, topic. So that's what I wanted to say. James? James, I assume that you would also like to comment on that. Yes, I, I'd agree with Ralph. I was going to say something similar. I suppose the only thing that um, I would add is that uh, without wanting to appear to be kind of reductionistic about the role of women um, in terms of reproductive health and fertility and uh, their children's nutritional needs, all of these things which... Um, can then be quite seriously uh, impacted by, for example, um, yeah, poor nutrition that we've talked about. Also, the increased mobilization of various kinds of chemical threats in the environment as a result of, um, of climate change and extreme events through flooding and so on, and also provision of uh, psychological and um, kind of informal health and social care, which much of the burden is taken by women. All of these are very active areas of research, I would say. Um, so I, I think that uh, as, as much as, you know, research, more research is always needed is the, is the kind of um, the joke in a way with all science. Um, I would say that uh, this, this is definitely a field with, with quite a lot of active interest uh, globally. Apologies, I have to go. So thank you very much. I hope you have a good rest of the meeting. Bye-bye. Uh, nice to meet you, Ralph. So um, I will wrap up soon, but there is one question left about the water management, which goes to Zbyszek. So, uh, a question about water management, which goes to Zbyszek. Controlling water routes and controlling water routes and uh, the fact that farmers um, access underground uh, underground water uh, does, does it have any effect on climate change and water stress? As a matter of fact, water control in Poland um, favors droughts because after World War II, uh, we developed infrastructure for which which was meant to to reduce the amount of water for farming areas, and this was understandable in, in that period that we had some waterlogged. Uh, areas, so we had to remove water from them to, to gain more farming areas. But the problem was that we kept doing the same in the 80s and 90s and the noughties, and we keep um, doing these works um, still in some parts of Poland. Added to that is uh, the, um, the 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 fear of, of floods, which uh, took place in Poland at the beginning of this millennium. So now we uh, have an infrastructure which is aimed at evacuating water as soon as possible. So we don't retain water; we just want to get get rid of it um, and evacuate it to the sea as fast as possible, which uh, exacerbates the drought, drought uh, threat. So far, underground water used by farmers ha hasn't been an issue in Poland because uh, the the uh, area which is um, irrigated is relatively small, which is under 3% of the whole area of Poland. But uh, indeed, there is a project uh, within the, the, the project that counters drought effects uh, run by the Ministry of um, Water Management. So this uh, is a project uh, prepared two years ago by Minister Grabatuk. Uh, 
And in this project, there's an idea for farmers to uh, build uh, wells and use underground waters without any limitation to uh, for farming purposes. And I think this is dangerous because this might alter local uh, water conditions and water balance. And 240 uh, cubic meters of water per hour. This is the, a modern irrigating system. So you can imagine just a few facilities of this type around the city of 10 to, tw to 20,000 people. And as, as a consequence, these farming wells will lower the, the level of drinking water for citizens and will lead to shortages. So yes, we should use underground water for farming, but only with uh, the use of what we call drop irrigation and only for for crops which are very sensitive for water shortages and we should really mind the the effect it has on local water conditions so thank you uh, we're coming to the end i can see that ralph has already left uh, I have a few minutes left, so just to wrap up, I will give the floor to, let's start with Hailey. Could you uh, conclude then James and then Zbyszek, and this is how we will finish this debate. Thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks Thanks for inviting me here today. I think it's been a really interesting discussion um, and it's clear to me that um, there's a lot of impacts coming our way from the changing climate in terms of extreme weather events um, and the fact that we really need to be starting to do something about it. I think that it's well that um, we need a much more systematic framework in place, both in Poland and in the UK um, to allow um, I suppose this money flow that Ralph was talking about to actually um, go from from making these policies and these promises through to actually actions on the ground that will help us to become more resilient to extreme weather events, but also to um, to plan for reducing emissions and making sure that any decisions we make to increase our resilience won't um, embed us into a, a high carbon future as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, James, over to you. Could you give us an overall comment on, on the meeting? Yes, thanks very much. Thank you for the opportunity to, to join this today. It's been really interesting. Um, only I, I can only agree really with uh, with what Haley said. And um, perhaps to add that uh, when we're thinking about um, trying to find uh, research opportunities that we try to partner with countries um, in in lower well lower middle income countries and to um, effectively try to think in a more systems way than a linear way and to try to encourage um, interdisciplinary research and uh, yeah let, let's keep up these kind of uh, discussions I'm sure that um, they they bring their own kind of benefit. Thank you, James. Uh, Renata, over to you. I have to go. Sorry. Okay, so Zbyszek, over to you. If you have to leave now, so please. Professor. I'm sorry to butt in, but I have to go now. So thank you for this debate. Thank you. Uh, a big thank you to the speakers. There are two uh, important matters I would like to mention. mention. First of all, an, an appeal to politicians. You should trust science, because science can give you solutions 
and ways of uh, action that can uh, help you avoid disasters. Uh, and secondly, this debate also makes clear that we need um, interdisciplinary teams and research and talks. This debate is very valuable because each of us represents a different field of study and the fact that we, we could contrast our opinions and viewpoints on um, climate change, uh, this um, broadens um, our opens our mind to different uh, points of view. So thank you and looking forward to more debates of this type. Thank you. Renata, now over to you. Thank you for having me. And just to add a point to what uh, uh, Professor Karachin has said, I think that we should uh, work together uh, in teams made up of um, people with expertise in different fields of study, because climate change uh, is a cross-field uh, aspect. And if we join forces, if we take an inter interdisciplinary approach, this can become our strength. Also speaking about adaptation and climate change. So uh, the point is for everyone to be able to contribute with their knowledge. Thank you. Unfortunately, um, the connection is poor. But as, um, as we are just about to finish, so let me just um, thank our guests for their interventions. Professor um, Ralph Toomey, Professor Haile Fowler, uh, Professor Renata Matuszewska and James Grelier and uh, Professor Karachun. It's been very interesting especially, uh, as Bishop has said, I mean, various and different approaches uh, to what the uh, future has in store for us and how we can prepare for that. Clearly, we see that we have various debates and um, agreements uh, on uh, curbing the emissions, but on the other hand, what is also extremely important is that we need to get ready. We have to be prepared. And that, that doesn't mean talking only. This also me, means um, taking action and also taking legal steps, um, introducing regulations and preparing society and also looking at the most vulnerable groups uh, in various countries, uh, such as women, children uh, or um, all the people, but this also means that we are responsible for the planet as such. And also there are groups with low emissions, but they emit little, but they are the most vulnerable. And there are also groups which emit a lot or consume a lot. Poland, the UK also do that. So we consume a lot, but we are also better prepared because we have more resources. Uh, let me also thank our viewers and, and interpreters, thanks to whom we could um, exchange our views. There is a link on Facebook in uh, the comments area. There's a link to the survey and please have a look, please try to um, fill in the survey once again so that we can uh, have a comparison uh, on whether uh, your opinions have changed because of the debate. And also a huge thank you to the British embas Embassy uh, 
for organizing this event. And this debate will be available at the Chronimy Klimat website. Uh, once again, thank you very much and have a nice day. Goodbye.